Good evening again. Yeah. We're uh, week three uh, of our series uh, that uh, we've called Better Than Coping. Uh, and I just love uh, that title. Uh, we live in a time in a world, you know, where uh, there's so much to be said about life hacks, uh, you know, by kind of working your way through, you know, wisely and so forth. It's not that we're anti-wisdom, we're, we're for wisdom. Um, but life is more than just a series of hacks. Uh, as the series title said, life is more than just coping. Uh, life is truly living uh, according to our purpose, uh, according to uh, the way or the things that the Lord has made us for. Uh, and so it also, um, it also goes without saying that there's a lot of value in taking time um, to really uh, understand how we can live that reality, how we can live that purpose through the challenges or through the struggles. Of life, and so that's where uh, the series was born. Um, you might remember a few weeks ago, uh, Quentin put together uh, something of an of a survey, which we gave out to the church, uh, asked a few questions, but could also fill in something that might, might have been on their minds. And so, uh, and that's where these uh, series or where, where these questions came from, these topics that we're working through over the next few weeks. Uh, and tonight, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about health. We're going to be looking at the importance. Uh, not the importance of health, but often how we are rattled and challenged when we are reminded that our health is failing. And so the question is, what do we do now? Now, uh, as we start off tonight, I want to make a few things clear. I look around the room, I think most of us, we, we, we know one another. You know I am by no means a, a medical doctor or a medical authority. Um, uh, so, so I'm not standing here to profess any wisdom uh, when it comes to medical health. Uh, as it does seem, I'm also a fairly young and healthy man, well, you know, mostly so, not through my own doing. Um, I've never suffered a terminal illness. Um, I've never been on the receiving end of a major accident. And so, so what I want to say, just as we start, is, is we're going to dive into Ecclesiastes and have a look at what the writer of Ecclesiastes says about life. Um, and I'm going to make a few statements as we go down, and we're going to see what God's Word says about this. But I'm just making these statements right at the beginning, because if at any point it seems like I might be flippant about health issues, or about a terminal diagnosis, um, or, or about any particular challenge you might be facing, I want you to know that is not the case. Um, that is not the case. Um, now, I know... Uh, you know, even as I look around the room here tonight, that there is a number of you that uh, have either experienced or passed or are going through fighting um, the reminder of ill health and challenged health on a daily basis. Uh, experience the struggle with illness uh, and with pain firsthand for yourselves. And I, I know that cases that is even way more than I can even try to imagine or understand. Now, given uh, what I do. Uh, as a pastor, not just me, uh, but it's kind of the nature of pastoral ministry, is almost on a weekly basis, I sit with men and women who are in the throes of some form of disease or failing health issue. Here at Emmanuel, there's a number of folk who've been diagnosed with cancer just over the last, uh, last 12 months, last year. There's two folk uh, in our community, in our church family, that I've come to know well, who are in the varying stages of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and what that's doing uh, to the energy of it uh, and their bodies. Uh, there's a few folk on dialysis. In fact, you know, something that still rattles me, and many of you will remember not that long ago, earlier this year, we lost Martin Hill, a friend and a brother in Christ. <coughs> Martin uh, was, had been on uh, renal dialysis for a number of years. He was on the transplant list. Uh, he passed away at the age of 28. A young man. Now, thankfully, he's with our Lord today. But we have all, uh, and I'm pretty certain about this, we've all been rattled by the reality of failing health. Uh, you know, we've all, I'm sure, watched men and women that we love dearly slowly fade away. And so, while I might not have experienced any of this firsthand, I want you to know is that every single time, no matter how old or how young or what the diagnosis specifically might be, when somebody gets that call to, to come in and, and see the doctor, uh, and when we've had a conversation about that, 
what I certainly have noticed, and, and you know, as uh, I've lost loved ones and family members and so forth, is you notice that it does something to you. It does something to you to want to hear that diagnosis or to receive that call. And to some degree, I think I understand why. But to a large degree, I think this is one of the lessons of life that the Lord is teaching us. Now, in short, we might say that our failing health rattles us. Uh, and maybe over a long time, or in an instance, when we get that diagnosis or get that call, it causes us to think differently, to, to start to question things, right? Now, we're here tonight to, to understand more of that, and maybe, um, maybe also to understand why we do that, why we question, how we can find hope in the question uh, and in the difficulty, how we can cope with it. And I'd like to do that uh, by starting here at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're going to start with the last two verses of chapter 11. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9 and then go through to verse 8 um, of Ecclesiastes 12. And please keep that passage open in front of you. Um, we're going to come back to it over and over as we work out our understanding of this. Rejoice, young person, while you are young. And let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. And walk in the ways of your heart and in the desire of your eyes. But know that for all of these things, God will bring you to judgment. Remove sorrow from your heart and put away pain from your flesh, because youth and the prime of life are fleeting. So remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of adversity come and the years approach, when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light are darkened, and the moon and the stars and the clouds return after the rain. On the day when the guardians of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, the women who grind grain cease because they are few, and the ones who watch through the windows see dim. The doors at the street are shut, while the sound of the mill fades, when one rises at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song grow fat. Also, they are afraid of heights and dangers on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper loses its spring, and the caper berry is no effect. For the mere mortal is headed to his eternal home, and mourners will walk around in the street. Before the silver cord is snapped, and the gold bowl is broken, and the jar is shattered at the spring, and the wheel is broken into the well, and the dust returns to the earth as it once was, and the spirit returns to God, who gave it. Absolute futility, says the teacher. Everything is futile. And when you finish this passage, you kind of just want to draw in the writer, give this guy a hug. <laughs> Absolute futility. Everything is futile. So he starts out by saying, rejoice while you are young uh, and healthy. He says, follow your heart, enjoy life while you can. But then there's this little caveat right at the beginning in verse 9 where he says, you'll be judged, by the way. You'll be judged on it all. All that you do, all that you rejoice. And then the writer of Ecclesiastes carries on to say, remember your creator in your youth because difficulty and decay are coming. And he does this by likening a walk down an old town street. As a, as a youngster, um, and I mean a, a real little youngster. I used to visit my grandparents in King, King Williamstown, and uh, where both of them, or both my parents, were originally from. And I loved it. Uh, I loved spending time with my grandparents. I loved going with my gran uh, down to town and walking down the main street uh, with her. I loved the beauty of the main street, the hustle and bustle. Uh, I loved the historical buildings and also the history that went along with it. Uh, subsequently, over the years, I'm a bit of a history guy and I've come to really dive into the, the history of the area. And I remember not with much detail, but I even remember <coughs> regularly visiting my, my grandparents, walk, doing our morning walks with them, and, and seeing building and development happening in the town. That's when I was young. And some years went by, my grandparents retired and uh, moved to another small town in the Western Cape. And after Varsity, during my first job as a, as a sales rep, I took the opportunity to go back through King. I wanted to see, you know, I wanted to pick up on, on, on those places that I enjoyed uh, as a youngster. 
And I remember being shot, right? Wasn't anywhere near the way that I remembered that small town. The main street looked tired. In fact, uh, there was quite a mess. Overflowing water, possibly sewage running down the road, and there were empty rubbish bins on the street. I don't know if it was one particularly bad day, but certainly as I carried on down Main Street, it seemed to be somewhat of the norm. A few of the historical buildings that I recognized looked bedraggled. Literally had uh, broken you know, doors hanging and boarded up windows. Uh, a new coat of paint was long overdue. And more so than any of the, the kind of physical realities that I was noticing as I was driving by, what was noticeable was the, the lack of energy and purpose that there seemed to be in the street. Few people were just kind of milling around <coughs> in the street. Now, this isn't unique to King by any way. It's a reality known by a number of the old Siskai and Transkai towns. And I'm not telling the story by any means uh, to, to bring up any political frustration or anything like that. But two things struck me as I was kind of lamenting old King Williamstown, the king that I, that I used to remember. Uh, and the first was that time doesn't stand still. And even in my youth, 20 odd years ago, remembering something, something that time most likely also isn't kind, doesn't stand still, and time isn't kind. And that also, when I was thinking back as a youngster, quite possibly, at least according to my memory, when I looked at King, William, King Williamstown back then, uh, I looked at it quite possibly on a very naive perspective, right? As a little happy-go-lucky you know, youngster walking down the street with his German grandma, loving life. Now we see something quite similar today to this reality here in Ecclesiastes. In fact, uh, in the way that it's written, this particular part of Ecclesiastes actually makes it feel quite current, right? You can imagine yourself walking through this old, tired town. In fact, the, the, the importance is way more than just the historical experience, as the writer writes about what this town looks like to him. See, it brings us to understand something of the reality of life, that dust returns to the earth, as we see in verse 7. Now, you'd be right to think that, you know, just reading this passage, that this is directly applicable to aging. But what you begin to understand more and more as the years go on, and so I'm told, is that failing health begins, begins to become synonymous with aging. Okay? Aging is never separate to the reminders and realities of failing health. You can't separate one from the other. And so we want to look at the seemingly hopeless writer, what he teaches us, about aging and about disease. And so the first point, uh, as we look at this description of what's going on here, is that before frailty and sickness are even a thought to us, as the young, we start out life with a limited perspective. Verse 9 and 10, Rejoice while you are young. Let your heart be glad in your youth. You see, that took me back to that thought that I had, was the naivety of looking at life with, with too much experience. That's the, case with, with, that's the case with youthfulness, right? You can often enjoy so much more because you're naive to the consequences and struggles of life. I don't know if you can identify, but as a kid, I was completely fearless when it came to heights and to, to sizable surf. But nowadays, <laughs> I find myself thinking twice before paddling out into big surf, uh, diving alone, or, or jumping off a, the top rock at Jan Sechat outside Jay Bay. I know there's a few of you who will know what I'm talking about. I reckon it's because I understand a little more of the potential risks, of the consequences, of what might go wrong uh, if I did it. When I was younger, that wasn't even a thought. And so there, uh, there's something to be said about the shocking reality of failing health. See, it's interesting. When I've sat with someone who has been relatively healthy, and then for the very first time gotten that terminal diagnosis or that, that cancer diagnosis and then compare that to sitting with someone who's been in remission for a number of years and then a few years later gets that diagnosis again there often seems to be a bit of a different perspective on their disease or on their struggle in one sense maybe it's understanding more that the diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean the end 
or maybe, quite possibly, it's the understanding that there is more to this than meets the eye when it comes to God's purpose. In it. So that's the first point. But the second point that the writer shows us is that decay is certain. See, we see that statement made as we walk down the street of life and health. In verse 1, it tells us, remember your Creator. And then over and over again, remember your Creator before adversity comes. Before the light darkens, before the milk sounds fade, and the grasshopper loses its spring. What the, what the, remi- the, the writer reminds us uh, is that decay is certain. Think about it. We know that it can happen to us. It's a sobering reminder, but we generally, most of us know that if we climb into the car tonight, heading home, it's, it's possible that that could be the last time we see one another tonight. And it might have a, that dreaded car accident or, or something else. We know that that can happen, but we never expect the call for ourselves. Possibly that's one reality of ministry. You see, you, know, you get so used to uh, walking this journey with others, helping others through this, that you start to think that you might not receive that call for yourself. And here the writer reminds us that decay or failing health is inevitable. In other words, he's saying, it's coming. <laughs> so we know that that is the case, because that's the result of the fall of man. Uh, Genesis 3.17, we looked at it in this morning's sermon, that all of creation was cursed as a result of sin, to suffer the effects of sin and death. And the Apostle Paul, in two places in Romans, uh, reminds us of that. First, he says that there is no person who is righteous. Romans 3, verse 10, there is no one righteous. He repeats himself, not one. There is no one who is righteous, first of all. And then later on in Romans 8, verse 20, he says that all of creation was subject to futility. So there's no one righteous, and it doesn't just relate to humanity, but all of creation. Everything that has been created is subject to futility. In other words, no part of creation has, res- has escaped the reality of sin and death. See, that's why physically there's rust and corrosion, why there's such things as metal fatigue. And friends, that's why there's cancer and leukemia, heart disease, renal failure, Alzheimer's. It's all a reality of sin and death. And so it's not if it comes, but it's when adversity comes. Now, while soberingly true in one sense, This helps us understand that while it's good to be fit, you know, while it's good to eat healthily and get enough sleep, be responsible stewards of our health and our bodies, the day will come, we proverbially speaking, maybe maybe literally speaking, and each one of us might get that call. For the last 20 years, both of my parents, my mum and my dad, uh, have suffered the effects of osteoarthritis. Uh, I saw it bend my grand's back uh, over. By the time she passed away, she was a, a real hunchback little lady. Uh, and I've seen it gradually affect my dad's own ability with his hands. Uh, you can't shake in your hand. He, he, it's been quite humbling for him. Nowadays, when we go fishing together, I've got to tie off the knots and do all the casting. Uh, and being on both sides of the family, I, I know it's an evident. You know, knowing that there's, that, that there's a, an hereditary reality to this. I haven't told too many people this, but about six weeks ago, I started with constant pain in my right hand, uh, in my joint, in my right hand. It's made it painful also to shake hands and, uh, and so forth. And even more so than the, the little bits of pain that I'm experiencing, kind of you know, dreading the reality of what's coming, is the way that it's rattled my confidence in my physical abilities. And I'm not talking about that here and now. But you see, it's I, I found at moments it has me constantly thinking about what it means further down the line. Kind of going to the worst case scenario. You know, thinking about how, how will I write? How will I tie the knots for my kids when we go fishing and cast and, uh, and so forth? How will I hold the paddle to be able to go for a good paddle on a good downwind day? 
And in one sense, remembering that this is the reality of the world that we live in, it reminds me that I can't escape it. But this is the important one. It also, it also reminds me that there's got to be something better. That there's got to be something better than that. And that brings us to the third reality that the writer points out. That failing health quite easily levels all that we gain. See, often you speak to somebody who's uh, either themselves been close to death or who's walked that journey with a loved one who's recovered somewhat. And they'll explain how they now, as a result, on the other side of that experience, how they value time and relationships differently to, to the past. Many times they'll say, you know, their view of material things uh, has changed knowing what they know now. And that's because failing health levels all that we value. Have a look at verse 6 and 7. Before the silver cord is snapped, the gold bowl is broken, and the jar is shattered at the spring, and the wheel is broken into the well, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. See, every object mentioned here, the silver cord, the gold bowl, the jar, the well wheel, uh, in that day and age of the Old Testament, those objects had profound value. Both in tangible value, in the way of gold and silver, but also in practical value, the way of uh, jars which held objects, you know, food and flour and water and that, and then the wheels that were used for lifting water out of the world. Uh, and all of that, each bit of worldly value, what's the writer showing us here? That it's shown to be finite. That it returns to dust. But as he says, the spirit or return to God. See that. Often the journey through illness or disease reminds us of that. See, it changes our perspective that we seen previously or changes the perspective of what we seen to previously be. Uh, often uh, we're reminded that those tangible things, you know, be it uh, wealth or success or, or whatever it is, that while they are gifts from God, Many of them don't have any lasting value. But one thing, one thing that is eternal. This, by the way, the writer shows us the finite reality of health itself. Have a look. Uh, he mentions the caperberry in verse 5. says uh, the caperberry has no effect. You know, uh, capers, as we know them today, uh, were back 3,000 odd years ago, were used for seasoning or garnishing. But interestingly, in the ancient Near East, in the time of that Solomon and well, quite possibly the writer was living, capers were also known to be used in cosmetics, in makeup. So what's he saying? When the caper berry no longer has any effect, see, from the flavors we enjoy to how we savor our value or, or our looks, it's all finite. It's all fleeting. It's all passing. And friends, the positive side of this is that it sets our perspective on what truly matters. So that brings us lastly to the remedy. And that is that the remedy is eternal. See, there's something sobering in that verse right at the end. We started with an absolute futility, says the teacher. Everything is futile. And if you set your mind on the finite, well then the sorry truth is that you will be set in that hopelessness along with the writer. Because it will all pass. It is futile. But friends, the remedy, the remedy is a tomb. You see, God's purpose has never been immortality in a mortal home. God's whole intention, His purpose, has never been that we live as immortals uh, in a world where everything else is subject to the decay of sin. Uh, we see that in Romans 8 again. Paul says, Romans uh, 8, verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation 
was subjected to futility. Remember that? Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. See, in and through our disease, our failing health, uh, what's happening is we're being reminded of the futility, of the limitations of life today. We're being reminded that we naturally, even without understanding it, we yearn for something more. We yearn for a time where there is no more pain, where there's no more suffering, where there's no more question about a limitation or the end of life. Where there's no more hurt and heartache and yearning for that loved one. That your heart goes out for. And we do that along with all of creation. We know there must be something better. Friends, and here in verse 5, without even realizing it, the writer alludes to it. It says, For the mere mortal is headed to his eternal home. And mourners will walk around in the streets. To God's plan and purpose has never been immortality in this mortal world. And you see, what God shows us, and what He shows us often through the limitations of our own health, through it, is that we need something more. And also, we've shown the reminder that we are powerless to change it. And so what does He do? What does the God, the Creator of heavens and the earth do? He brings us to our need for redemption. He brings us to the need of seeing sin dealt with once and for all. And He doesn't just leave us there. But He sends His Son, Jesus Christ. A promise seen right from the very beginning. A promise seen in the time of Solomon, of David, and of Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet writes this about the Messiah who has been sent to save Isaiah 53, verse 4, he says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn are guarded and stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And friends, we are healed by his means. We are healed by His words. He has taken on your pain. He has taken on your affliction. The Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God has come down into this world to know the futility of life in this world. And then to take it upon Himself so that He can free you from it. If you will just be. As we finish up here and move into a discussion, and I hope there's some great questions to you. I know, I know that I could never cover you know, every physical, mental challenge that you might be facing, or a loved one might be facing. But friends, the realities that we see here tonight are what give us hope, and that we get them, are what will see us through. And of what God is using to show us more and more of Himself. So if there's any practical advice to be had, it's found in the two kind of commands in this passage. The imperatives of Luke, as we would say. Rejoice, not in your circumstances, but in the one who makes you eternal. And remember your Creator. For he is doing this. He has got you. And he ultimately, not to sound cheesy, he is the living. That's right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that as we just think about the burden that is just day to day life for so many today, so many who for day by day by day will know the reality of pain or know the reality of discomfort or or, or even just the seeming uncertainty of their days that feel more and more numbered, even though we know that none of us 
can affect even an extra minute or hour or day to our lives. Father, we know that you have given us hope, but hope which goes beyond ourselves. A hope which goes uh, beyond uh, even uh, the medical, uh, the doctors and the nurses and those specialists that you have gifted to care for us. It goes beyond the treatment which we thank God for. So Father, as we face these struggles and difficulties of failing health, Lord, will you continue to bring us to you? To remind us, Father, first of all, that they are not meaningless. That through the pain and the struggle and the uncertainty, Lord, you are showing us and you are preparing us for something better. And that as your word assures us, you will grow us through that, we pray. And so, Father, give us peace, not in ourselves, but in you through these times. Help us understand more and more of yourself in the medical and physical struggles. And Father, by your grace, cause us to look to you. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.